once you have done this once, even though it was in a severe crisis, the temptation will be for people to figure out that in the next crisis, you'll do it again. And in fact, much of the trouble that the big banks got themselves in this time around was precisely because they were already working on moral hazard. They were already counting on a bailout if things got bad. And we can't fault them for that because now we see they were right. Okay? That, that means there's no downside risk. Go for the moon. Shoot the moon. Go for buying investments with a high payoff but high risk. Because if they don't work out, well, you're not going to lose anything. The taxpayers will pick it up. But if it does work out, you become fabulously rich yourself. It goes right in your wallet. We've, we've privatized the profit and socialized the risk. What a wonderful world for corporate charlatans with friends in high places. And you got to add that. It's no good to just be a corporate charlatan without friends in high places in the government because only the government can come in, create money out of thin air, and bail out anybody and everybody. But this has put us in a situation where there's real doubt about what the future of our economic system will be. Uh, I hope a lot of this goes away. Government officials keep saying they have no intention, no intention of permanently keeping these policies in place. They don't, the loans are going to be repaid, blah, blah, blah. Don't believe it. Many of these loans cannot be repaid, so they're not going to be paid. That's one sure law of social science. People will never do what they can't do. Okay? And a lot of these loans can't be repaid. So they won't be, and that means they're going to be losses to the taxpayers. And for what? For keeping zombie firms going for years on end, looking as if they're not bankrupt when they've been bankrupt all along. Ben Bernanke has treated this crisis as a liquidity crisis. He thinks it's just like the early 30s when we were having these bank runs. We had no deposit insurance, and so a bank run would set off a cascade of other bank runs, and pretty soon perfectly good banks were, were made uh, uh, insolvent. But it's, it hasn't been a liquidity crisis. That's a misrepresentation. It's been an insolvency crisis. It's been the bust from a lot of malinvestments at high places in the financial industry. And because they were at high places, the government came along to bail out its buddies. And they did. But now we've got firms that are walking dead. Walking dead. You think Bank of America is a solvent institution? You think Citigroup's solvent? Go down the list. I don't think so. They just haven't yet owned up to how little some of their assets is really worth. So, that's that. Well, maybe we have time for some questions at this point. I'm sorry I talked so long. Yeah, I think your it's on. I think your presentation is fantastic, but I think a lot of people that uh, would play devil's advocate might say to you that during World War II or during some periods of the New Deal, there was great growth as far as GDP and index numbers of those sort go. So I was hoping you could give a response that I know I've seen before in your writings to to this kind of uh, accusation. Right. The, uh, well, the GDP did grow between 1933 and, and 1937 when it turned down again and lost about two years worth of growth in that uh, interior depression of 37, 38. So I'm not saying there was no growth uh, in the early New Deal. There was some growth, but, but it's hard to know how much it was because uh, uh, a good deal of it was the government purchase of final goods and services. And we don't know what those are worth. Uh, those, aren't, those aren't real market goods and services, so we have no way to know. Uh, you, we, we may think we know. We, we, we may say, well, if a guy uh, is working for the government and getting paid uh, $3 a day, and similar guys are working in the, in, in, for private firms in the area, and they're getting $3 a day, well, that's a good price. That's what we should 
which should credit here the government adding to the income stream, $3. But, uh, but we're not entitled to make that inference. That's, a, that's a, just a leap. We don't, we don't have any way to know what things are worth when the government buys them. Now, where that really comes into play in full force is during the war. Because during the war, it looks as if, depending on which set of uh, Commerce Department stats you look at, uh, anywhere from, from, from 60 to, to 90 percent increase in GDP between 1941 and 1944 at the peak. If you break that down and say, what was it? What, what was causing this increase? What you find is that during, during that time, <clears throat> the uh, civilian goods and services fail. And all of the increase and then some in GDP was government purchases of war-related goods, all of it, and then some. So private investment fell as much in the early 1940s as it had in the early 1930s. It almost disappeared. On net, it did disappear. Uh, 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 private consumption fell substantially in 1942-43. And it may have recovered a little bit, but still never, didn't get up to the 1941 level until the war was over. Uh, only growth that took place during the war is this phony growth of government spending for bombers and, and soldiers' pay and, and the rest of it. So what was that worth? Uh, well, the way the accounts are kept, it's worth whatever the government paid for it. That's to say, it has no rational basis. It, ha it has no basis in the same kinds of trade-offs made when you or I go out and pay a dollar for something. That's our way of saying this thing is worth um, more than something we could get with the dollar somewhere else, okay? So we need to add a dollar to, to, to total value being created by whoever sold us that final good or service, okay? But when, when somebody in the War Department decides how much to pay the Boeing Company for a B-29 bomber, all we know is that some bureaucrats and some corporate executives and some guys in, a, in, in, in other war agencies cooked up a number and handed us money to Boeing. That's all there is. There's no economic rationality there whatsoever. Because it wasn't their money. Okay? That's the key. That's the key. The only reason price system reveals valuations is that it's an indirect way of revealing the trades people are voluntarily willing to make. And when you get into government pricing, you've left that world. These aren't prices people are voluntarily willing to make. They're not making the trades. They're just putting down numbers that they think they can get by with that'll, that'll help them in their careers or, you know, set them up for a career later working for the Boeing company. It happens. It's happened thousands of times. <laughs> I didn't invent it. Yes? Yes, why do you think uh, the stock market didn't crash until the fall, until September of 2008? Uh, housing prices peaked in 2006 by early 2007. Subprime problems were apparent. Uh, there was anecdotal evidence. I went to Miami on business in May of 2007, and just driving from the airport downtown and looking at the condo building in downtown Miami, you immediately go, oh my god, there's a problem here. Right. Yet the stock market kept on going, peaked on October 9, right. at least the Dow did, October 9, 2007, yeah. and then we go practically a whole nother year before the stock market crashes. Why do you think mm -hmm. it took so long mm -hmm. for the stock market mm -hmm. to crash? And also, do you think energy prices played a role in that? We had very high energy prices mm -hmm. earlier on in 2008. Well, I, I, I think, you know, trying to explain the stock market short-term movements is like reading tea leaves or, you know, the, uh, the entrails of, uh, of lizards or something. I, I don't know is the short answer. I don't know why that happened. I have some speculations I could offer you. Uh, the, the main one would be that, that many people had believed what they had been told for years, which was that the, the, the real estate market was largely immune from serious depression. Okay? The storyline for years had been that, that real estate declines only in spot markets. So yeah, real estate might be in trouble in Florida 
or it might be in trouble in the Bay Area in California or somewhere else. But you know, the overall US real estate market was sound because they'd tell you, you know, the population's growing and income's growing and, and families are being formed and blah, blah, blah. Well, <clears throat> uh, you know, Greenspan's distributed this story himself on, on many occasions. Uh, people looked to gurus like that. For a long time, Greenspan's word was like the word of God. Uh, so a lot of people were reassured by what seemed to be authoritative judgments that real estate could not uh, fall into a general crash. Uh, 